I got into audience studies because I was interested in people and I was interested in popular culture at a time when there perhaps seemed to be more of a divide between high culture and popular culture. Um, so people and popular culture, that is audience studies. Um, I tended not to appreciate critics like that's the Adora Adorno or Neil Postman um, because I thought that they were just being grumpy and suggesting that uh, you know, people were sitting at home watching garbage on TV and that they were morons for doing so and that the stuff on TV was basically rubbish. How unfair, I thought. And, you know, people are not morons and you really can't fault the stuff on telly that's on telly, even if you've got quite a high culture idea of what people should be doing with their time. If you spend some, if you can steer your way through BBC Four, More Four, History Channel, National Geographic, all that kind of thing, you can have a very classy, quite educational evening of entertainment there. And so... Because of this, when in audience studies, we defended people, showing how they're often critical and discriminating viewers. Um, and we implicitly or explicitly defended TV and movies, uh, explaining how they weren't rubbish after all. Uh, so the thing is, there's nothing really wrong with the content. Stuff on telly, you know, we may take exception to various bits and bobs. Uh, but due primarily to television, I'd have said, uh, we've kind of learned to be audience. That's my argument here. Um, for large chunks of each day, and quite unlike any other point in history, uh, we've learned that a way to spend time is just to sit staring at a box in the corner for quite a long amount of time. So we've learned to be audience, and at the same time, uh, surely not coincidentally, then we've sat around whilst the state of the world has been getting clearly worse. As well as learning to be passive audiences, um, I, it seems maybe in some way it's connected that um, we teach our kids to be quite passive learners. This is a very good book, 2008, Guy Claxton. He argues that basically the school education system that we have tends to crush curiosity and questioning and in its drive to train students to do well in particular exams. David Hendy, who I work with, David Hendy's a historian, he's an excellent historian, he's written a book about Radio 4 that was piled high in borders before Christmas. Um, and his daughter had got this project which was about Hitler and uh, you had to write an essay explaining uh, wh why Hitler wasn't very nice, really. Um, and so David Hendy is like, very excited. We've got all these history books, encyclopedias, all this kind of stuff. He's like, well, we've got a wealth of resources we can throw at this task. And she was like, no, Dad. And he's like, why not? Look at the wonderful books, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she said, no, 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 we've been told the answers already. It's these eight points. And she had to write down these eight points, and that's what would get her a good mark. <laughs> And I was shocked and horrified by this story from David Hendy, who lives in Oxford. You know, not, I don't think his children go to an especially horrible or bad school. Um, he said, oh, yeah, it is like that. And in a previous one, well, then he got his daughter to put in all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, and she'd been marked down because she hadn't put down the points that she was meant to put down. So I was shocked and horrified by that. And that's probably that anecdote which leads me to read the Guy Claxton book. More positively, uh, Guy Claxton suggests the idea of learning muscles, which are these qualities of mind that he says that education should foster in children, uh, and mostly, sadly, doesn't. These qualities in mind, he suggests that powerful learners are drawn to learning, they ask questions, they like to explore, they're happy to experiment, they look at the world from imaginative perspectives. Uh, they're logical and critical, and they can collaborate with other people, work together in teams, all of that, can reflect on their experiences, and in particular, that they're resilient, so that they're happy to make mistakes. Mistakes are fine, because they know that mistakes are things that you can learn from. Again, it leads to a kind of passive paralysis, I would say, uh, as the state of the world is getting worse. So that's not good. Let's look at some facts about that then. In order to do this, uh, we turn to the Stern Report from October 2006, commissioned by the government. It's an economic analysis, curiously enough. It's all based on economics. So he literally has put a price on human life. It's buried in the numbers somewhere. Uh, he says, the cost of doing nothing about climate change uh, is 5 to 20% of global GDP per year, every year, forever. And he compares that with the cost of avoiding it, which is only 1% of global GDP. I mean, 1% of global GDP is a lot. But the cost of avoiding it is obviously less, you'll have noticed if you know about maths. So it would seem reasonable and proper, and it's probably what we all expect, that the government would do something about this. As individuals, what can you do? You can change your light bulbs. Um, and maybe even insulate your loft, but it seems kind of pointless and maybe even deluded when your neighbour down the road is leaving all their lights on and driving a 4x4. So we do need the government to kind of make certain place limits on us, basically, so that we all are in the same boat. Because people are fine when they're all in the same boat, like in World War II with rationing. When everybody's subject to the same limitations, then nobody really minds. They feel like they're all pulling together in terms of a, a common cause. So this all seems like a big nightmare that I've just painted there. Uh, how can we fix it? And how, indeed, is some media studies guy 
going to be able to suggest anything. Um, of course, I don't have one big solution. Um, there may not be one big solution. Instead, we might be able to look for little things that might help us along the way. And the thing that I'm meant to be talking about, or maybe I should get a move on, uh, is this shift from what I'm calling a, a sit back and be told culture, which involves those things, more traditional media and factory learning, to a making and doing culture, which can involve uh, people making and sharing things online and tools of thinking that we're coming on to. So it's, it's a less passive relationship to the world. Um, There's the transition movement, which is uh, started off in Totnes, a small town, village in Devon. The transition movement is basically a positive movement based on vision, envisioning a future, creatively thinking of a future, where we just have to live our lives somewhat differently to cope with the changes that are brought about by peak oil and climate change. So it's not, some, it's not really a protest movement. It's a, it's a positive thinking about the future kind of movement, which is quite nice. Um, you might think, OK, but that could only ever really work in a little village like Totnes. That's what I thought. Then it turns out um, Brixton is a transition town. I haven't been to Brixton for about a year, but uh, last time I went, I hadn't, I hadn't quite noticed. Maybe, maybe it's been transformed. I'm not quite sure. Um, but people are working on these challenges in different places, therefore. Then other creative things happening. As I said, I live in Walthamstow, so this is uh, the E17 Art Trail, which happened recently, involving uh, 300 people just putting on exhibitions on their front walls, on their hedges, in their windows. That's an exhibition of photographs of cats in Walthamstow that somebody put in their window. Um, there's some other things happening on the trail. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big open art project. just seems nice to get people making and doing things in the community. <coughs> I like that. Um, this is another one at Stratford where people are invited. It's artist-led, but people are invited to uh, get stuff out there, share stuff from their everyday lives and put it into a more kind of art kind of context. And this is Make Magazine. Uh, it's a US magazine, which is just about people making stuff. This is quite a technology one. But then as well as that, there's Craft Magazine. It's Sister Magazine, uh, which is full of lovely kind of cool craft projects. And why am I talking about all this stuff, you may think? Um, it's because it's about making, and I think there's maybe a kind of resurgence in making. Uh, the argument is that through making things and sharing things, we feel more connected to the world, I think, uh, and the world has more meaning for us, rather than just having to receive things made for us by machines or companies. If we're making stuff, I think there's a kind of hands-on engagement with the world which you get there, uh, which connects Web 2.0, making and sharing things, and these more kind of physical making activities. Um, there's a little diagram about this. Uh, just connecting up a few different things. The happiness point is that uh, studies of happiness show that when we're more engaged with the world, sort of creating our own meanings, then people are basically happier. As we know, money actually doesn't make you more happy. It's other things. It's about an engagement with the world. It's about doing stuff that you find rewarding. Uh, that connects with Ivan Illich over there. He was a 1970s radical philosophy kind of guy. Um, I'll, I'll read out this a little bit. He says, a convivial society, that's obviously one he's in favor of, should be designed to allow all its members the most autonomous action by means of tools least controlled by others. People feel joy as opposed to mere pleasure to the extent that their activities are creative, while the growth of tools beyond a certain point increases regimentation, dependence, exploitation, and impotence. Basically, if you make your own stuff, then you feel happier. If you're making use of stuff that's imposed on you by others, less good. Coming back to this, um, there's also that book by Richard Sennett called The Craftsman, came out earlier this year. Um, again, that's about the satisfaction that we get from taking time to make things. It's quite a nice book. <laughs> um, he suggests that craftsmanship, link, craftsmanship <laughs> links with a sense of well-being and then links to self-esteem. And in particular, he says that the things we make ourselves may not be perfect, but their imperfections reveal our individuality and therefore our presence through having made something and it might have things wrong with it or seem a bit individual, like this starfish. Uh, this is a starfish that I made for Finn. How does this then connect to my own research? We're moving on again. Um, well, basically, I've been developing, in the course of the last few years, qualitative research processes where people actually, actually are asked to make things with their hands. We take them through a process where they have to make something, uh, perhaps collage I've done, or video, or drawing, or Lego. Um, then that process gets you thinking with the hands. There's more nerve endings in your hands. Uh, that means connections to the brain than anywhere else in your body. So there is a kind of meaningful sense of thinking with your hands, I think. 